Uh, in this video, I would like to complete uh, the forecasting topic. So we have briefly talked about the importance of forecasting and, and related questions. Uh, we've talked about point and range forecasts. Uh, we've talked about the steps of the forecasting process. And uh, we have talked about uh, the different types of forecasts, qualitative versus quantitative. And then we have talked about their respective merits, strengths, and weaknesses. And then uh, I posted the video uh, about the time series analysis. Okay, so so there are three types of quantitative forecasting methods. Okay, uh, the first one is time series analysis. And then uh, there is causal modeling. Okay, so that is basically regression analysis. Okay, so uh, and then the third one is simulation models. Now, uh, in business, simulation models are rare because they are fairly sophisticated and complicated. And if you're wondering what is an example of a simulation model, well, um, you know, weather forecasting. Uh, is based on simulation of weather patterns. So these are very complex uh, mathematical and, and computer models. So uh, most of you will never need to worry about them. But uh, most of you uh, will, um, uh, will be exposed to time series or regression analysis in business. So, so what's the difference? The difference is uh, time series analysis is a black box approach where um, you don't care about cause and effect. Okay, so the time series says there's a pattern for whatever reason, there's this pattern, and it will continue into the future. And time series analysis doesn't know or care why there's this pattern. It just is. It's there, and it assumes it'll continue into the future. Uh, in contrast, causal modeling says, uh, "Well, um, if if there is a pattern, there must be a cause and effect relationship there. So we see uh, demand going up, demand going down. Uh, I mean, demand doesn't go up or down randomly. Okay, there must be some factors either." Uh, the prices have gone down, the demand spiked, or either there was uh, an alternative product introduced, demand went down. So, so the idea in uh, causal modeling regression analysis is let's figure out what moves up or down demand. Okay, so so once you know what increases or decreases demand, then what you can do is you can uh, predict uh, how demand will be affected if you increase price or decrease price or if you advertise more or less. So, so that's the basic idea behind causal modeling. Now then the question becomes should you use time series or should you choose causal modeling? Okay, So they have uh, uh, time series analysis and causal modeling have their respective uh, strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so uh, the com comparison is on this slide where uh, it says uh, uh, advantages of causal modeling. So when when should you prefer causal modeling over uh, time series analysis? Okay, the first one it, sa it says. Uh, it's typically better for long range forecasting. Okay, so that means time series is better for short term forecasts. So if you have, let's say, um, several years of data and then you're looking to predict next month, okay, or next quarter, so you're just simply taking, uh, let's say, uh, several dozen observations and then adding one or two more uh, predictions on top of them. Uh, 
So in this case, uh, you're not looking too far ahead. Uh, so then, it's best to use time series. Okay, but let's say you have data, and you're trying to uh, uh, see what's going to happen in five years, ten years, twenty years. Then you may have to think about uh, causal modeling, which is regression analysis. Now, uh, the slide also says um, uh, if there's, uh, there are turning points in the data, okay, if there are shifts in the environment that affect demand. Okay? So, for example, if you know uh, there's a uh, tax increase that's going to take effect in the future or um, you know your competitor to the, your competitor will introduce a um, an alternative product a substitute product okay so if you know things are going to change in the future uh, and the, uh, the 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 demand will shift as a result then it's better to use causal modeling if not, if things will remain largely the same, then uh, you can use uh, time series analysis. Okay, and um, the third uh, point here says can generate better understanding of mechanisms under underlying uh, sales and demand. Okay, so this is important because when you when you do regression analysis. Uh, tells you which factors affect demand. Okay, so then you will that that gives you options to influence demand. Okay, in time series analysis, you don't know what's going on. You don't know why this demand is going up or down. Okay, uh, the time series analysis doesn't tell you that, but if you do regression analysis, you'll have a much better idea what makes the demand go go up or down okay so uh, what are the, some some of the disadvantages of uh, causal modeling uh, first of all it requires more data compared to time series analysis because time series analysis um, just requires historical sales that's it. It doesn't require prices. It doesn't require demographic information. It doesn't require advertising information. It doesn't require competitor. None of that. So it just looks. Uh, if you give time series analysis, historical records, uh, how much you have sold in the past, then uh, time series can extrapolate that into the future. But uh, when you're looking at cause and effect relationships. You need uh, data that represents the effect, and then you need data that represents potential causes. Okay, so um, so in in the regression analysis in in causal modeling, um, you will need uh, sales data plus uh, price data, competitor competing products data, etc. Okay, so you may have you may or may not have this type of data, okay? Uh, so, so that's a disadvantage of uh, regression analysis. Another uh, point is that uh, regression analysis uh, usually um, uh, requires some expertise, okay? Um, the reason for that is, I mean, in this course, um, we're going to briefly talk about linear regression, but linear regression is uh, the, the simplest of the simplest cases. Um, usually in real life data you have curves, you have um, other correlation, you have um, uh, many different, um, many different uh, artifacts um, which, which makes real life data messy. So you have to account for all these idiosyncrasies of the of the data set. So um, so causal modeling, regression analysis re requires a bit of more expertise than uh, time series analysis. 
So uh, we've talked about time series analysis, random fluctuations, trend seasonality. Uh, we haven't talked about cyclicality, but that's uh, uh, not, not very um, relevant at this point. Um, okay, and then we've talked about uh, different methods that may be appropriate when uh, there are different types of patterns pr present in the data set. Okay, naive method, simple moving average, uh, etc. And at this point, I want to show you a uh, an Excel sheet that um, I uh, made as an example. And um, let me, uh, let me just pause this for a sec. Uh, I'm going to post this uh, Excel worksheet online and um, on Blackboard so you can you know play with it. Um, the first thing that um, that's kind of uh, out of the ordinary is you'll have this uh, yellow warning, uh, security warning. It says uh, there are macros. Okay, so um, you can just say go uh, enable content. Okay, the macros. I've written some macros for this. So uh, where does this data come from? This data come from uh, um, two fashion companies uh, uh, gar uh, you know, garment apparel retailers Levi Strauss and Benetton okay so uh, what kind of data do I have I have uh, sales data that goes from 1990 through 2011 okay and these are the sales okay so so what I have um, on the graph here, uh, let me magnify this a bit, is, um, so this blue line uh, represents the actual sales, okay, and, and the red line is the uh, forecast, okay. In this particular case, the forecast is based on a uh, simple moving average where n equals 2 okay so that means uh, this particular forecast is the average of the previous two okay so I, I take the average of these two and I generate this forecast okay for the next period instead of taking these two I take these two uh, observations I take their average and I generate my forecast okay and then I take the average of these two and I generate this forecast okay so so as you can see um, I have a generated forecast for uh, uh, the years through 2011 now let's uh, change the number of uh, years number of periods that I'm using so instead of two I can average three periods, four periods, five periods. Okay, so now what, what's going to happen? Okay, so um, to to do that, to to look to see the change. Okay, I'm going to use this scroll bar, and as I click here, and we'll go to uh, three, four, five, etc. At the same time, this red line will be updated because it's my uh, forecast. Okay, so now look at this red line. I'm going to click here and we'll go from 2 to 3. Okay, oops, it went to 4. Okay, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay. So, so as you can see, the the forecast uh, becomes smoother as I increase the number of uh, periods that I average. Okay, so so why does that happen? Well, that happens because uh, as I move from period to period, I dropped I drop the uh, earliest period and I add a new period so for example if I have uh, 
five periods that I'm averaging. Okay, as I move from one period to another period to forecast a new period, I drop the earliest period that that was included in my uh, uh, in my average, and then I add a new period. Okay, but what happens is that the uh, four periods remain the same. Okay, so two consecutive periods uh, will share four out of five periods that go into their uh, calculation. Okay, so the forecast will not be very different from period to period. So the more periods I use, the smoother forecast the forecast will be, the less change will be observed from uh, period to period in terms of the forecast. Okay, so uh, so this is an example of uh, um, of how the number of forecasts affects the uh, uh, how smooth or volatile the forecast is. Uh, below that, I have the uh, weighted moving average. Okay. So here uh, I have the same data set, the same time series, years from 1990 to 2011, the exact same sales numbers. Okay. So here what I'm going to do is I'm using two, uh, two periods. Okay. So to generate this forecast, I'm using these two. But instead of taking their average I'm taking their weighted average so so what happens is that uh, this uh, period uh, that's just one before okay uh, gets 80 percent weight and the period two before gets 20 percent weight so the more recent period is weighted by 80 percent, the less recent period is weighted by 20 percent. Okay, so I've calculated uh, the forecast using this formula. So now let's let's change these weights. Okay, so so I'm going to use this scroll bar to change the weight. So now uh, at 80 percent my most recent period uh, observation has the most weight so I'm going to decrease that and go more towards a balanced forecast okay so more recent and less recent observations will have similar weights uh, for example I'll go to 70 30 okay 60 40 okay 50-50. Now they're equally weighted. Okay. And here what I have is 10% uh, for the least re most recent and 90% for the least recent. Okay. This is what it looks like. Okay. Here's the other uh, extreme where uh, the most recent forecast has 90 percent weight and uh, the least recent has only 10 percent weight okay so now which which combination of percentages is best okay so um, usually we will not be able to tell that um, just by looking at the uh, uh, graphs visually for that, I have calculated uh, the forecast errors. Okay, so let's talk about the forecast errors for a bit. Uh, let me go back to the uh, uh, yes uh, forecast quality. Okay. So 
so uh, the yes evaluating forecasts uh, all forecast quality measures are based on the forecast error okay what is the forecast error the forecast error is um, the actual minus the uh, forecast so uh, in period T how how far off am I from the actual forecast E sub T uh, to find that out I take the actual observed sales and I subtract from it my forecast okay this is the standard definition of forecast error and I don't like it why because if you over forecast this uh, formula gives you a negative number if you under forecast this formula gives you a positive number very counterintuitive normally what you expect is over forecasting should be associated with positive errors under forecasting should be associated with negative errors but this formula gives you the exact opposite however uh, because all books and, and, and papers use this uh, I'm going to use this okay I don't want to confuse you so so here's uh, you really have to think always about the opposite positive errors means uh, you have under forecast uh, negative error means you have over forecast okay so the quality of forecast uh, has two main um, uh, uh, aspects okay the first one is accuracy simply accuracy means how close are you to the actual sales okay so if the difference between your uh, forecast and actual sales is small that means you're very close to the actual sales and you're highly accurate okay so that's the definition of accuracy and then uh, there's bias okay uh, bias means now first of all if there is no bias what do we expect to see so if there is no bias we expect to see uh, approximately the same amount of positive errors and negative errors so you should be over forecasting uh, about the same about as much as you under forecast okay but if there is a bias that means you're either over forecasting most of the time or under forecasting most of the time so bias means there are systematic deviations in your forecasts okay so those are the two dimensions accuracy and bias are the two dimensions of forecast quality okay and another distinction we're going to make is absolute measures versus relative measures okay uh, absolute means I'm off by let's say five million dollars okay so that that may mean something that may not mean something uh, so five million dollars could be a huge error or it could be a small error uh, to figure that out uh, you need to compare your error to your um, actual observed demand so that's how you calculate the relative error okay so so let's start thinking about the errors so what I have here is the first one is mean uh, forecast error okay so so what does that mean uh, this is what I do uh, 
going back to the Excel uh, spreadsheet. So, so I have here um, actual sales, uh, 1,703, and this was my forecast. Okay, so what is uh, my error? My error here is actual minus uh, forecast. So 1,703 minus uh, 1984. Okay, so that gives me a negative error. And we need to think the opposite. Negative error means we must have overestimated demand. And actually we have because it was 700 something and we thought it was going to be 1900. Here's another example. Uh, here my demand is actual observed demand uh, 1719 but the forecast was 1612. Okay, So we have under forecast. So let's calculate the error. Uh, sales minus the forecast okay it's 107 so the the uh, error is positive which means we have underestimated demand okay so so I have the error for each of the periods okay and so so what do I do with these errors what I do is I take the average Okay, so as I average all of these, and here's a hint for you, when you select um, a range of numbers in Excel, it gives you the average, it gives you the count, and it gives you the sum. Okay, uh, but here I've just calculated it here. So average is 44. Okay, what does that mean? So that means, now if there was no bias, your positive errors should be about the same as your negative errors. In other words, you will have over forecasted about the same amount as under forecast. Okay, so uh, the average of forecast errors, mean forecast error, shows you how biased you are. Okay, ideally the uh, mean forecast error should be zero. Okay. Now let's let's see what happens uh, to the average here as as I change uh, the weights. Okay. So um, so now it's 44, and I'm gonna just click here once. Okay. 50. Now now it's becoming more biased. 56 okay 61 okay so what this means is that as I move the weight in a particular direction I'm I'm getting more biased now is this biased and over forecast bias or under forecast bias since the average is positive it's uh, under forecast in other words, uh, what happens? You can you can clearly see this is uh, the uh, forecast lags. Okay, so for example, here in 1995, okay, uh, the forecast uh, the actual was this much, and my forecast was below that, and my forecast increases to this level, but after uh, after the actual reaches that level. So, uh, so my forecast is increasing. My, I'm sorry, the actual is increasing. Forecast is trying to keep up. Okay, so and then the actual uh, shifts direction starts to decrease. Uh, forecast also starts to decrease, but there's a lag. Okay, so what this means is that we're under forecasting. We're lagging. We're trying to catch up. The, the actual demand. So the uh, actual drops, the forecast follows up, okay, but then the actual starts to increase. But it takes a while for the forecast to increase because it's it's lagging actual demand, okay. So 
why is the forecast lagging? Well, the forecast is lagging because there's a trend. There's an upward trend. Okay, and the forecast method, moving average, is not taking account, taking into account that trend. Okay, moving average is not appropriate when there's a trend because moving average doesn't take trend into account. So as a result, the moving average uh, lags demand when there is trend. Okay, and we can see that in in the bias. Okay, so our forecasts are biased. Uh, our forecasts are under uh, our forecasts underestimate actual demand. Okay, so this is the first measure of. Uh, forecast quality, mean forecast error. Um, it's a measure of bias, okay, and it's not uh, a measure of accuracy, okay. So, uh, so you want this uh, as close to zero as possible, because, um, as I said, when there's no bias, you will have an equal amount of over forecasting and an unequal amount of under forecasting and the positive and negative errors should be about the same and they should cancel out each other and the average should be close to zero when there is no bias or very little bias now how do we measure accuracy then the the uh, key to measuring accuracy is uh, you want to uh, prevent positive and negative errors cancelling out each other. How do you do that? You do that by uh, taking the absolute value of forecast errors. Okay. So in this case what happens is uh, you look at the forecast error it could be positive or negative and then you take the uh, absolute value of the forecast error okay so these uh, these bars uh, indicate the absolute value function so what's the what's the effect of the uh, absolute value function so here here's the absolute error so these are the errors actual errors in these are the absolute values of these errors. Absolute value function is very simple. If if the error is positive, uh, it stays positive. If the error is negative, it becomes positive. So minus 228 becomes 228. Minus 221 becomes 221, etc. So when I add them up and take the average, what happens is that uh, positive and negative errors don't cancel out each other and I get the average here 209 okay so what this means is that on an, on a uh, given on on a period okay on any given period I'm off by 209 units either way okay on average I'm off by 209 units either above or below uh, actual demand okay so so is this good or bad the thing is you just need to try so I'm uh, I'm going to play with the uh, uh, percentages here and uh, I'm going as I change them let's look at how this 209 figure changes so I'm just clicking here once 200 wow we're we're getting better right so so what happens here is uh, uh, we're off we were off by 209 now we're off by 200 on average and then I'm gonna click once more 191 okay so we're we're getting closer okay so uh, 185 etc okay so um, so as you change the parameters of the of the uh, 
forecasting method, the quality of the forecast will also change. Your accuracy will change, your bias will change, and then to find the best parameters you need to play around uh, and try different parameters and see which parameters give you the best forecast quality. Okay, So, so this is uh, mean absolute deviation and you want this uh, as small as possible too. Okay, now another way to prevent positive and negative errors uh, uh, canceling each other out is uh, to square the errors. Okay, so this is mean squared error. What is the point of squaring errors? Uh, the point of squaring errors is um, it amplifies uh, larger errors. Okay, so what this means is that um, if you're uh, concerned about larger errors, okay, so so if you can live with smaller errors, but you're very concerned about uh, larger errors, okay, the uh, mean squared error will give uh, will amplify, magnify. Uh, larger errors to a greater extent. So when you square errors, smaller errors will not increase as much, but larger errors will increase much more. Okay, so so let's let's try this out in our ex Excel uh, spreadsheet. Okay, so what I've done here is I have also calculated the square errors. Okay, so basically I just multiply this number by itself to get the square and uh, so the average is here, okay, and let's see what happens as we change the parameters, the percentages of the uh, uh, forecast. So as you can see, uh, the mean squared error increases. Okay, so we're uh, we're uh, the the um, accuracy of our forecasts is uh, is decreasing. Okay, so you want a small mean squared error and small mean absolute deviation for better accuracy. Okay, now these two mean squared error and mean absolute deviation are absolute measures of forecast accuracy. For example, here it says, uh, well, I'm, I'm off by 218 units. Now, is this good or bad? One way to, um, to assess whether this is good or bad is to look at it from a percentage perspective. So I'm off by this amount, but percentage-wise, is it 1%, is it 20%, um, 50%, etc. So, so to calculate that, okay, uh, yes, uh, we uh, look at the mean absolute percentage error, okay. So, so we begin with the uh, actual error, we take the absolute value, okay, so this error becomes positive, uh, and then we divide it by the actual demand, okay, so this is what percent off I am on this particular period, okay, and then I average those percentages over T periods, okay, so uh, so what does this look like? Um, let me show you. So um, let me uh, okay. So um, this is my actual. This is my forecast, and this is my error. Okay, this is the error. Uh, this is the absolute error, 210 units. 
So to calculate the percentage, I, I take the absolute error and divide it by the actual. Okay, So 210 divided by 1703. And that gives me uh, 12%. Okay, so uh, in this particular uh, period, in this particular year, I was off by 12%. Again, this could be positive or negative. The next period, I'm off by 16%. The next period, 4%, 10%, 5%. What percent am I off on average? So I just take the average, okay? I take the average of these individual per absolute percentage errors. It says I'm off by 10% uh, on average, okay? So as I change the parameters, okay? You know, it just uh, goes down to 9%, but doesn't change much after that. For example, these numbers mean absolute percentage error, uh, mean absolute deviation, mean squared error. They change, okay? But uh, this becomes roughly the same, okay? Uh, this also changes, but when you round it up to a percentage point, it's just 9%, okay? So, um, and what I've done is uh, I've uh, talked to you about the uh, bias metric, bias measure, mean forecast error. I've talked to you about the mean absolute deviation and mean squared error, okay? These are uh, absolute measures of accuracy. And then I've talked we've talked about the uh, mean absolute percentage deviation MAPE. Uh, which is very popular in practice and uh, it's a relative measure of accuracy. Okay, So uh, here uh, in the following slides I've given you some uh, some very simple examples of these. Uh, so here are my periods 1 through 5, Th these are my demands, actual observed demands, and uh, we're generating um, a forecast. Okay, so uh, let's say we uh, take the average of the two previous periods. So for period three, I average these two, 180, I get nine. Now for period four, I look at period two and three, okay, the average of 80 and 70. Okay, so that's uh, 75. For period 5, I take period 3 and period 4. I take the average, which is 80. Okay, so these are my forecasts. Uh, how biased am I? Well, uh, let me calculate the uh, forecast error, which is dt minus ft. So dt minus ft minus 20, dt minus ft, 90 minus 75, 15. 80 minus 80 is 0. Okay, so I take the average of these. Okay, so I add them up, which is negative 5, and I divide negative by 5 by 3. Okay, so this is my uh, mean forecast error, this is my average bias. And then uh, mean absolute deviation. Uh, so I take the absolute value of the forecast error. Absolute value of minus 20 is 20. Absolute value of 15 is 15. Absolute value of 0 is 0. I uh, add them up, 35, and divide by 3. 35 divided by 3. Okay, this is my absolute mean absolute deviation. And here I have mean squared error. So Square of uh, minus 20 is 400, square of 15 is 225, square of 0 is 0. I add them up, 625, divide, them by, divide that by 3, I get uh, mean absolute, uh, mean squared error. And finally, 
what is the mean absolute percentage error what is MAPE um, so I take the absolute error and divide it by the actual so 20 divided by 70 is 29 percent uh, 225 divided by 90 is 17 per 17 percent 0 divided by 80 is 0 percent okay I add them up 46 percent I divide it by 3 about 15 percent okay so this is in general how you how you uh, measure forecast quality there are dozens and dozens of other measures of forecast quality but these ones are the most commonly used okay so in your uh, in your assignment what I want you to do is find the uh, best alpha okay so what you do here is uh, you'll have an alpha you're gonna try different values of alpha and uh, let me okay so as alpha changes these values will also change okay so uh, 84 for example uh, here 68 57 so as you as you um, change alpha you'll get different uh, forecast accuracy and bias measures and figure out which alpha gives you the best overall forecast accuracy and uh, lowest forecast bias okay so um, I'll uh, I'm going to stop here and I hope to see you uh, in the next class.